Okay, let's go ahead and get underway. Welcome everybody to the June 2017 edition of the Roundtable. Uh, we're here just one month short of our seven-year anniversary, and we're looking forward to a big, uh, big range of festivities a month from now. I can't believe we're still doing this after seven years. We'll be looking at our results here in a few minutes, and uh, that's also quite encouraging. I'm joined here tonight by my friends Ken Kavula and Cy Lynch. Hugh McManus is unable to join us due to business commitments. My name is Mark Robertson. Um, founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing. Both Ken and Cy have been investing for a long time, picking stocks for a long time, and both of them have very solid track records and in the in the realm of actionable stock ideas. That's why we're here. We're here to share ideas and just have some fun. We are approaching some new highs. We do like to have some fun. We did sneak uh, Nick Stratagos. He's a edu uh, investment educator, volunteer in Pittsburgh because you know, you do this for seven years, things do repeat, and, and the Pittsburgh Penguins did repeat uh, <laughs> uh, on, for the Stanley Cup this year, so we stuck, we snuck Nick back onto the slide, just in honor of that. Let's go ahead and get it underway, take care of the legal documentation here. No investment recommendation is intended by anything that we do here. If this is all about demonstration. We are sh taking a look at the method, the process, the analysis, the portfolio design and management concepts that have been part and parcel of the modern investment club movement for the last 75 years or so. So everything we do is for illustration. We like the word demonstration. We're, we're taking real companies in real time and showing you how we look at them and how we keep track of them. And we will be sharing a couple of those stocks here tonight along with a look at the portfolio. Here's our standing agenda. You can see our knight there could go on a little bit of a diet. We have trimmed him down over time over the last seven years, but it looks like he might be putting a few pounds on again. We might have to attack that. Um, again, welcome. If you're, if you're brand new here, we, this is wide open. Ken is monitoring. We will go live with people if they want to ask questions. And then we also, as you see down at the bottom, we do have an open Q&A at the end. And we basically hang around and answer questions as long as people have them. For the Man, scoreboard. Mark, I have a hand. I have a hand in the air, Mark, from oh, Nan. Good. So, yeah. Nan, I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to try to unmute you, Nan. Every and once in a while, she, we... she took her hand down. So that was an inadvertent raised hand. Uh, so let's just continue, Mark. Okay. She must have liked something I said, and you know, th thrust her hands in the air just to celebrate or something <laughs> like that. We do keep track. We're serious about this. We'll talk about what we're doing here, but we do keep track and we we monitor the the performance of our selections. Like I say, there is no there are no guarantees in the in the world of investing, but we really are trying to bring you actionable ideas that are worthy of further study. We are going to take a look at the current condition of three companies tonight: Whole Foods, Biotechni, and NIC ticker symbols EGov there, and with respect to possibly selling them or removing them from the portfolio. You see the three stock picks there by Cy, Ken, and myself, EPAM, Middleby, and Kroger. We do an audience poll at the end, and again, even if you're joining us for the first time, again, a big welcome hug and an invitation to participate in the audience poll when we get to that. And uh, we, we keep track of what everybody votes for and how they do over time, and we just literally try to have some fun while we're sharing ideas. Here it is, just the, the summary of what we're doing. Uh, the people that, that come here and, and make representations and stock suggestions are people that have demonstrated an acumen or a skill at, at doing this by winning various contests or participating as educators or purveyors of model clubs across the country, you can imagine. And all, it's a simple thing we ask, just bring an idea. Bring a single favorite investment opportunity to describe the type of opportunity that we see. Um, we do want to outperform the market by five percentage points. We'll take a look at that in a second. We benchmark versus the Wilshire 5000, and we would like to see the majority of the stocks that we select actually outperform the market during their holding period. Well, here's a look at the results on a month-to-month -month basis. Going back over the seven years, you can see that uh, what you're looking at is the relative return. Uh, the relative return is nothing more exotic than comparing the actual performance of the investments we make versus mirroring benchmark investments in the Wilshire 5000. 
So what you can see here on the far right, we are now at a point where we're up to all, nearly 3% better than the stock market. In other words, if you've taken all the dollars that we've invested in a theoretical basis over the last seven years, we would outperform $1,000 investments in the Wilshire 5000 by three percentage points. That actually comes out to be 12.5% that you see up at the top here. That's the absolute rate of return. The calculation is no different than what you do with your club accounting or your Bivio club accounting. Same type of thing. It's a rate of return. You can see about half the picks have worked out over time. What I get kind of juiced up about is that trend is in the right direction. The other thing is it is near an all-time high for relative return since we started. So we'll just, we'll just hope that uh, that continues and that's a good trend to be chasing. The average investment club, and for most individual investors in this community, we do try to beat the market by five percentage points. That's this red dotted line. We hope that we get there. One of the Knights is actually operating north of that line, and uh, but he's not with us tonight. So <laughs> kind of wish he would phone in his, uh, his pick for the night because it could be a good thing. Any questions at this point, Ken, or any comments that you want to make? No, we're staying real, cu real current, Mark. Okay. Sai, how about you? Any comments as far as patience or? Patience is a good thing. Uh, I mean, two comments. Uh, again, patience is a good thing, uh, and we should continue to be patient. I think, and in that regard, remember also in this entire period, we have not had a significant down market. And I think that where our methodology particularly excels is going into a bear market and then exploding out of the bear market. And we have not had that kicker, if you will, relative to the market. Um, and so, again, we need to be patient until that happens. Uh, the other thing that I'll just say, and it goes along with patience a little bit, but also while 5% is a wonderful standard, and I think we should maintain it as a goal, and it is certainly achievable, over the long haul, remember, if you're investing over 30, 40, 50 years, as m many people we hope are, even 1% will stomp the market over an extended period of time. So, Good point. Mark, I think Cy and I are reading from the same prepared text uh, <laughs> because uh, my, the, the big model club that, that I belong to that's, uh, that's going on about 14 or 15 years now of, uh, of history, uh, about a year ago uh, started moving down a tenth of a point on a fairly regular monthly basis in our relative return, and it got as low as 2.0. That's just flat 2.0 uh, better than the market. And in the last eight months, uh, it's recovered now to 2.7. And again, that's without any of the traditional kinds of things. It just means, I think, that when we, we find an exceptional stock, it's, it can stay exceptional in a good market as well as in a bad market. So uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with what our model club's doing, and I'm especially pleased with what this huge tracking portfolio is doing. I think it's demonstrating some of the best things that we can show from better investing philosophy and better investing methods. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just pile on and say that Sai is absolutely right. When we look at what happened in 2008, 2009, while it was gruesomely painful, what we did witness across the community was shallower drops and much more rapid launches coming you know out of that great recession bear market uh, horrible time frame and we haven't had that I hesitate to use the word opportunity but we haven't had that type of thing as I was saying so yeah not that we wish for that but we certainly want to be in the position to take advantage of it all right let's go ahead and press on Here's the actual um, top 20 by percent of total assets. In other words, the 20 largest positions in the tracking portfolio. There's about 90 selections made over the last seven years in the portfolio, uh, ranging from the, at the top, you see Cognizant Technology. And by the way, that link at the very top of the page will get you access to all 90 of them. What we do is we invest $1,000 into each idea when, the, when it's actually either nominated or voted affirmatively. So in the case of Cognizant at the top, you can see that number 12 next to it. 
that means it's been selected 12 times. So $12,000 has been invested in Cognizant over the last seven years. That $12,000 is now worth $20,585. And you can use the key down at the bottom to see how many times these various stocks have been selected. A couple of these are actually uh, one-time selections like NetEase. We'll talk about that in a minute. One-time selection means $1,000 has been invested in NetEase. It's now worth $6,500. Um, they don't all work out that way, but uh, we, we're certainly grateful when they do. So you can you can basically break it down and see you know who the major contributors are to the portfolio performance and the the strength in Cognizant over recent months probably has sigh breathing easier and certainly has bolstered the portfolio performance. Any other comments about any of those guys? I just wish Mark that I would have been as stubborn about. Uh, net ease as Cy was about <laughs> cognizant. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'd probably yeah. be on the on the cover of Barons if we'd done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rats. Um, one of the companies that I will point out here, to, down towards the bottom, just under that six for NIC, is Amazon because we were talking about in that talking about Amazon in the pre-session. I think Amazon is a two-time selection. Yes, it is. So two thousand dollars invested in Amazon not that long ago is now worth $6,600. It was actually the best performing selection over the last year, and Hugh made that selection at a national convention live roundtable in Chicago a couple years ago, and not a single person in the room voted for it at the time. And I, sometimes I do think you have to be ready for some less traditional, out-of-the-box, I hate that phrase, but non-traditional <laughs> thinking. And uh, I would just urge people to give that some thought. Ulta was also selected by Ken at, uh, at the National Convention last year. Yeah, what, what I like, Mark, is that when you read down this list of the top 20 holdings, uh, we're not really reaching for unknown stocks in most cases. Uh, I think our community is probably familiar with 16 or 17 of these stocks. Even the casual uh, members of our community, I think, can probably say that they know at least a dozen or more uh, of these stocks. and. And these are the backbone kinds of stocks, with some exceptions on the list, but these are the backbone of, of what good, better investing portfolios uh, include, what they, what they put into the portfolio so that they can begin to approach that 5% beat the market kind of goal. Absolutely. By the way, that universal display, I just have to point that one out. That's a three-time selection. That's the fifth largest position in the portfolio. Ken and I selected it on the same night, and the audience uh, seconded our motion or thirded our motion. So $3,000 has become $13,000. We'd like to have a few more of those, too. Absolutely. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what we might do with the portfolio itself. And this is a... I'm not going to go too deep into this tonight. We've been kicking this around for over a year. Ken and I did a presentation at the National Convention recently. We're also going to do an encore performance of that in, uh, the Tuesday after Labor Day. And we'll be obviously talking about this over the next couple of months where we're going to summarize the type of stuff we've been looking at. And it really comes down to, I'm going to refer to them as two rules, the first being Rule one. Ken, do you want to explain the genesis of what this rule one is kind of about? Uh, based on sure. I, one of the, the things that I like to do, and, and I got the bug from Mark, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, but I really like to go back to some of the literature that was prepared by the Better Investing Association when it was called NEIC uh, back 20, 30, even 40 years. Uh, I'm especially fond of the investor's manual that is copyrighted, depending on which particular copy you have, copyrighted somewhere in the mid to late 80s. And when I was reading about selling in that particular investor's manual, uh, I, I found that the, the gurus at the time were quantifying sales. They were saying 90% of all sales have to do with a single reason. And the single reason basically in simple language is to try to make the portfolio better. That leaves the other 10% of your sales for reasons like you need the money or the company is absolutely falling apart and you're going to sell no matter what. Although a case can be made that even when a company is falling apart, you sell it to eventually make the portfolio better. So uh, that's rule one, and we decided, uh, can we come up with some triggers that will help us a little bit on rule one? Uh, 
Uh, both of us are kind of fascinated with the rule of five. Uh, it appears in a lot of different investing uh, uh, literature, not only literature associated with better investing. I think the original rule of five uh, comes out of uh, uh, Graham, doesn't it, Mark? Not in Graham? And it's kind of a tug of war. It could be David L. Babson. It could be um, T. Rowe Price. Um, well, they're all playing around with that that idea, though, at approximately the same time. Peter Lynch definitely and, published some stuff about yeah. it. And, and what Mark and I are doing is trying to, you know, the, the simple reason about using the rule of five, and if you're not familiar with it, it says that out of every five stocks that you choose, one of them will perform perform much better than your SSG says it will, and three of them will perform pretty much in line with what your SSG says it will. So that's 80% of your choices will perform at or above a well-prepared conservative SSG, but that leaves one that just doesn't perform and you scratch your head and you try to come up with a reason why and and it's kind of impossible to do so and and if you want to take portfolio management down to its most simple terms it's to get rid of the one stock out of the rule of five that that isn't working and to try to keep those out of your portfolio in the first place well, think i don't yeah, I don't think that amounts to to a huge amount of selling uh, in any given year, uh, but I think it does a, amount to maybe selling a stock or two in any given year. You yeah. know, we were tarred with the brush of being uh, buy and forget investors in the late 90s and early part of this century, and nothing I think can be further from the truth when you read the writings of the folks that put this association together, when you listen to Mr. Nicholson talk about non-traditional investing, and there's a place for it in a portfolio along with uh, good, solid, up, straight, and parallel investing. So uh, well, I, I think what we're doing is we're searching for some triggers right now, right, Mark? Well, Ken, I'm going to actually steal your thunder a little bit and just, just remind that this is a work in progress. We are still exploring. But this first slide is is what we believe, in fact, all the investment clubs I've been affiliated with and I think most of the ones Ken have, this has almost become a, a standard operating procedure. What you're looking at is we take the dashboard or the list of stocks and rank them from the lowest return forecast or the lowest PAR, PAR stands for projected annual return, and rank them from the lowest to the highest. And what you're looking at is, you know, remember, there's about 90 stocks in here. These are the ones that have the lowest return forecasts, and I'm just showing the ones that are less than the market average right now. So at the, at the top of this list, you see Whole Foods. That's on the hot seat tonight. And I think it's virtually an automatic sell. Why would we say that? I think Cy, Cy was already mentioning something as he came online about this subject. Right. Yeah, Amazon is buying it. So unless you think somebody's going to outbid Amazon, why would you continue to hold it? Yeah, the stock yeah, price is up probably 30% in the span of about a week. And that's been a few weeks ago now. And, and, uh, and you know, Mark, that's a, that's a great rule to follow most of the time for any stock that has somebody else make a big bid for it. Uh, from my way of thinking, there's only a couple things can happen after that initial bid is made. Uh, Cy mentioned one of them. Somebody can outbid them, but that's a relatively rare occurrence. Uh, usually the things that can happen is the deal can fall apart, and then that stock price goes right down uh, to where it was before the deal was announced, or the deal can settle but it might take 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 months for that deal to settle. And during that time, the stock that's being acquired is virtually dead money. There's, there's, there's not a whole lot of movement up or down in that stock price once that deal is moving towards completion. So I, I think it's a pretty good rule for most clubs especially to follow is when something like this happens with one of their companies, uh, take the money and run. And you know, if the deal falls apart in three months, you can go back and buy Whole Foods back and you can probably buy it back for a lot less than you <laughs> sold it for. Yeah, that's seriously yeah. that I've seen people actually do that. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the other thing to keep in mind is when a company like Amazon buys a company like Whole Foods, you know, subjecting it to the modern investment club analysis, what you're typically going to see is that return forecast in the, I say, as low as minus 10 for a high-tech company. 
to low single digits, and that's certainly what we see here for Whole Foods. So I think this one gets jettisoned. We we celebrate the 17% gain that we have in Whole Foods, and we move on. Uh, the second uh, company uh, mentioned here is is actually one that it, Cy selected nearly six years ago. It's a one-time selection. Notice that that thousand dollars in Techni, it was just Techni back when Cy made that selection. Now it's Biotechni, is now has doubled and is worth nearly twenty-one hundred dollars. But again, the same situation. It's a little bit uh, sketchier. Obviously, a biotechnology stock and. Uh, you can throw fairly aggressive assumptions at it and still end up with a, a price that has either a low return forecast or near the sell zone. Any any comments or thoughts about that, Cy, along the way? Back no, I, yeah, I, th I think that Biotechni, I mean, it's selling, it's selling basically at an all-time high and has been a little flat on earnings, all those sales and everything have been doing well recently. So I think it's a good take your money and run. Yeah, and it's it's basically kept up with the market and done pretty well. And again, doubling in price over the last six years, so nothing wrong with that in general. And uh, well, and it's the kind of discipline that we want to help move our portfolio averages. Our portfolio's par is a little bit beneath where we'd like it to be. So when you sell stocks with par values of less than one and a half percent, and then we hope tonight replace it with some stocks of par values, you know, of ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen percent. Uh, I think that we're doing exactly what you need to do, whether your portfolio is seven stocks large or whether it's a tracking portfolio like this one that has close to, what did you say before, Mark, 90 stocks in it? It's 90-something, yeah. 90-something, so, yeah. With yeah, respect to, I, go ahead, Ty. I, I was going to say, and I think I'll point out to kind of uh, follow up on, on a couple things Ken just said. Notice, too, the the uh, the market right now is, what, six 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 eight. I think today is, right. is my or is is my par. So with the and of course Whole Foods is a is a special situation. We've already discussed. Although everything I'm going to say would apply to it, but uh, Biotechni as well, and really Oracle probably as well. Once you get past that, you can start debating a little. But we're we're not talking about just a smidgen below the market. You're talking about way below the market and when it's uh, again uh, at an all-time high and and so forth uh, there's there's really no reason to continue to hold uh, at at that point in time if if the stock is in fact overpriced and is a good company you're going to be able to sell out of it buy back in uh, when it becomes more reasonable at some point in the future the other thing that I'll just mention very quickly and I said it at the end of, of uh, probably at the Q&A last last time, at least some of my own anecdotal looking at my own personal cells, both in written model portfolios as well as some of my own, we, at least I do, and I think it can be generalized, we tend to do a better job selling on valuation than on quality. And I think part of that is because we've already set such a high quality standard that uh, frequently management ends up doing better than we think maybe they will. So yeah, I would agree with that. And the other point well, I'm to make with the Cy, I would Cy, I would make the point also that quality might be a little bit of a lagging indicator. Uh, it takes a little bit more time, I think, for quality to degrade itself. Uh, with the numerical value at least, or even for the things we kind of read and look for, than it does for, for valuation things to degrade. They they go down pretty quickly when when things are in disarray. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, when the wheels come off, it's not pretty. The other point I want to make for people that get a little bit flustered or confused by this is, again, many of these companies, including Stryker, by the way, Stryker was selected at the uh, opening uh, session seven years ago. Um, that's a one-time selection. We're $3,200 at this point. Many of the companies at the top of this list are at the top of this list with the lowest return forecast because their stock price performance has been so strong. So, I mean, a lot of these are up there, not because their fundamentals have degraded, but because the stock, look at McDonald's. Um, McDonald's is way up in stock price, and it's on this list because it's just maybe getting a little ahead of itself, but it's still not anything to, to rush out and sell according to our analysis. So let's go ahead and talk about the other thing that Ken was talking about, this this notion of 
identifying the stocks that maybe fit this rule of five situation, that one, that 20% of the time. Again, that's just a bell curve distribution, folks. Uh, no matter how much homework you do, and you can put in a, a Superman S on your chest as you do your analysis and, and make a presentation to your club or colleagues. I did that for a couple of companies here in the last year or so that just completely fell apart, um, even though my analysis was perfect and, and strong. Um, that, it's that rule of 20, or that rule of five, where 20% uh, of the time you're, you're just not going to be able to see things happening. What you're looking at here is a flow chart where we're talking about companies have been held for less than a year, but for some mysterious reason have lagged the market by at least 20%. So they're minus 20% or more. Now, if it's over a year, we're going to go back and use that same analysis we just talked about for uh, in the previous slide. But then we basically walk through a number of tests. You know, is it a core holding? Well, if it's not and it's getting massacred, you just simply call a timeout sell it and and reassess your situation if it is a core holding make sure the return forecast and the quality are okay we're going to do that in a second with egov um and the same thing with the favorable industry comparison well maybe some some sometimes companies are lagging the overall stock market because their in, industry is under pressure not the case with egov but it can be in fact that's what helped us to hang on to uh novo nordisk and a couple others in recent months and turned out pretty well if it passes all those tests but you still have uh, concerns, again, it's it's pretty simple. Just retain it, but be very vigilant. Watch for signs of weakness and some of those red flags. So, again, it's back to the rule of five. There's actually only two positions in the portfolio right now. You can see how we track the positions. Back on Jan in January, January 31st, 2017, Ken nominated NIC, and uh, the audience seconded the motion, so they're both there. In recent days, uh, it has just recently dropped down to that minus 20 or below threshold that you see on the far right. So it, it falls onto the hot seat thanks to the rule of five, not rule one, but thanks to the rule of five. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is Novo was on the hot seat you know, based on the rule of five last month. We regard it as a core holding that's facing industry challenges. So we're hanging in there. Notice that it's actually come back out of the, the minus 20 or below zone, and it's actually off the list. Now I just left it there to make a point that our patience has been rewarded, and so far Novo seems to be having a bit of a, a recovery here in, in recent weeks. Well, here's the chronicle for NIC. Ken, do you have any comments on on what we're seeing here? No, the, the chronicle, the blue line is quality, and uh, I like to see that quality line relatively consistent, and I think it's been consistent for, you know, quite a good period of time. Uh, those little ups and downs don't particularly bother me when they're, when they're you know, a couple of percentage points one, or a couple of, of uh, percentile points one way or the other. Uh, I will say that uh, the red line, which is showing par values, uh, has moved down and it's moved down along with price and that's not necessarily something that I like to see uh, with par moving in the same direction as the price of the stock. I like to see par moving down when the price is moving in the other direction which is a really good problem to have. Uh, I will say that that Mark I, I don't own eGov presently and uh, I was not aware of the the drop in price in the last uh, couple of months I did a little bit of research before uh, the session tonight and could find no solid reasons for the degradation, but this price uh, movement going in a downward direction has been going on since uh, it looks like uh, the beginning of May sometime in a general downward slope. Uh, so uh, I guess I, I would want to find out why, uh, but as I said last uh, session, last roundtable, uh, we're experimenting with these triggers, and in order to experiment, I think we need a large enough sample base. So if our flowchart is showing a sale for these two positions, uh, I would like to pull the trigger so that a year from now we can look back and decide whether this trigger has any validity to it or not. Uh, we're not ever going to find out if we never use it, so uh, my suggestion is we use it for these two holdings and see what transpires. Yeah, it's, this, it's actually been selected six times, so we'll be talking about selling just two of the six just to see what happens. And notice, uh, 
some of you have been asking, and we're, we'll actually have a session on this at one of our Belgium Tuesday sessions. Um, you can go to big charts, and in using the interactive chart option at the end, you can actually graph the, the company that you want to study here, in this case, eGov, and then actually do it. Uh, this was the time that the decision was made back at the end of December, so they all start together here on the left-hand side of the chart. And then compare it versus the, the Wilshire 5000, which is this one, shown right here. You can see how well the company has done or, or how poorly it's done versus the Wilshire with that red line. You can see here's definitely a 20% a difference. That's what, where that 26% difference comes from. But the thing that bothers me a little bit is we, we know some of the companies that are in pre, under pressure, the information services and technology companies in this realm. But this is the industry group. Uh, it's Internet. I don't remember the exact phrase for it, but this is the, the index for the industry that eGov is a part of. And the thing that disturbs me is that during this entire drifting downward, and again, we don't have a rationale or anything to explain that yet, the industry itself has actually performed pretty strongly. So for whatever reason, that's divergent, and uh, you know maybe we do give at least two of the six positions a timeout and, and watch what happens. Again, you can actually do this exercise on big charts, and we will be demonstrating that. My my guess, and and it's largely just mathematical because Ken was of course looking at the Chronicle, and you did not see a significant degradation in quality. Uh, you see a slight little dip in quality there, uh, along with the dip in par, but uh, it, more than likely, what is driving the par down and could also be driving the price down is a decline in PE, which is market expectations. Because if, if the fundamentals are not going down, the only other thing that can drive down either price or return is PE. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, so something's going on pretty big with the PE, which again, maybe the market may just be wrong or the market may be picking up on something. Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Trump stocks, and uh, there's not been very much talk about non-Trump stocks, but eGov works with state governments uh, setting up portals for all kinds of uh, different things, uh, from as mundane as, as registering to vote, uh, to paying parking tickets, to getting hunting licenses, and all different ways for citizens to interact with their state governments on the internet. And I'm just wondering if this might be a non-Trump uh, stock uh, that people are throwing out anything involving the government right now, uh, anything involving a little bit of regulation or or whatever, and and maybe not stopping to do you know to do their due diligence. Uh, we 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 had this same general conversation when we were talking about uh, Maximus, which does healthcare administration, and came to the conclusion finally that no matter what the healthcare system ended up being, uh, th they were going to need good solid companies to administer with whatever it was that was going to be set up. I think in the long run, the states are going to need good, solid companies to administer their portals. And uh, we're just finding right now uh, that this is not a particularly popular uh, thing to be in. And, and again, if we're going to test our ideas, let's, let's stick with them and test them and see where they are. We're not playing with real money, thank goodness, so let's see where they are a year from now. Okay, well, I show us at about 9 o'clock, so let's go ahead and press on. We'll, we'll log in those three selling transactions. It's a partial sale on eGov, and uh, as always, we'll keep score and see what happens. So with that, let's go ahead and transition into the actionable ideas part of the session. And Sai is returning to EPAM Systems for, I believe it's the third time. Yes. Mark, can I can I jump in just for about eight seconds before a slide sure. begins? Sure. Could we add a slide to our standard deck here that shows the positions that we've uh, sold based on this new rule, so that we can kind of keep them at the top of our head and see how they've been performing after the sale? Sure. 
I mean, we don't have a whole lot of them that we've used yeah. this rule for yet, but if we could, could kind of use that as a scorecard to help us with this flowchart, I think it would be very useful. Right, and when we get to the q and A, I'll actually show the cover story describing our discussions in Cincinnati with the audience, and I think we should just pencil it in and make that type of uh, head scratching and rolling up the sleeves part of that af just after Labor Day uh, session on that Tuesday. Great, great. I'm sorry, Cy. Uh, go ahead with EPAM. Uh, all right. Uh, yes, this is the third time I'm uh, picking EPAM, and I'm going to do a little bit of a, of uh, both a consistent uh, with the way that I usually do my uh, presentations, but it will be a little bit uh, different the way that it ends up working out. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I came up with the selection and, and uh, a few things. not going to talk a whole lot about the company since I did pick it in February and March, and, and so you may be familiar with it, though I've got a couple of slides about it. EPAM is an IT um, information services company. They, again, do the uh, IT outsourcing, the same as Cognizant does, the same as um, Infosys and, and other companies like that. Unlike those companies, EPAM tends to be US-based and somewhat European-based in its customer base, but it is uh, essentially former Soviet Union as far as where its worker base is. It is not an Indian uh, or an Asian-based um, outsourcing company as far as the, the overseas, so it's a, it's a little bit different take there. You can see um, the record for the company very up straight and parallel and it has been around uh, for over 23 years now um, so it's while it's got a relatively limited public history uh, the company itself has been around for uh, quite a while next slide uh, again I did as I have uh, as I frequently do and have uh, recently I started by uh, just taking the round table ranking by par seeing what came up and as you can see, EPAM's right at the top of the uh, green zone uh, here, so it was attractive to me. Uh, next slide. Uh, well, I'll also point out, go back just one second, uh, Mark. Uh, notice what I did between these two slides, I, I wanted to test and see if there was any, any other company not in the portfolio with comparable characteris characteristics, and I took the quality and the par at the time, and I just rounded both of them down, and so I did a, a stock search on 90 quality and 16 par, which is then the next slide. Again, EPAM pops up. You see some uh, yellow companies have been added, but nothing uh, has come up, uh, particularly in the um, uh, around the same uh, area here. Uh, next slide. I ended up, and, and I, I did this uh, preparing uh, for the slide this morning before I went into my office, and then when I was uh, came back home and was preparing the slides for tonight, I'll be very honest, I don't remember where ADS or Alliance data came from. <laughs> I, I actually thought it was Mark's ivory soap screen, uh, but it did not pop up there. But on, on some playing around screens, uh, Alliance Data came to my attention, and I was actually going to do Alliance Data as uh, uh, tonight's presentation, um, despite this looking around uh, EPAM that you, you just saw. Uh, but notice uh, the PAR is significantly different. EPAM is about, uh, about three points higher. Similar industries are not uh, by value line and by manifest in the same industry, but but they're in technology, and again, in the technology area, EPAM top, pops up as one of the top companies, so that guided me back. What really tipped the scale for me, though, is although Alliance Data is uh, listed as an information service company, uh, the majority of their revenues actually uh, come from credit card processing. They're, they, they essentially do private label credit cards and they do customer loyalty programs, uh, frequent flyer type uh, programs in Canada, and they're expanding there. So that's their area. The, the um, Of course, customer loyalty programs, that would be more traditional, but the uh, private label 
credit cards, they're really a credit card company and none of my analysis nor manifest analysis is done uh, for our, you know, uh, what we tend to look at specialty um, financial company. So I wanted to look at it more as a financial company before I brought it uh, to light. So I jumped back into EPAM. So that's how we got EPAM. Here's just quickly what it is, uh, a leading global uh, IT company. They, they specialize in uh, product development and platform engineering. That's their software systems that they write. Uh, they're, as you can see, it is a global company and uh, has some uh, Forbes and Fortune endorsements. Uh, the next slide's what I really like about the company, just in looking uh, at it, summarizing. Here are, the, you can see their customers. Uh, they're pretty well diversified across industries. Unlike many of the IT companies, uh, they're not um, overly concentrated in any one industry, although they do go pretty heavy in the financial uh, services and the travel companies. Uh, but you see their spread and notice that they um, have the top companies in their area as clients. Five of the ten largest banks, you can see five of the ten top TV networks, uh, all ten of the top pharma companies and, uh, and the like. So they, they've got a good solid client base and again it's both geographically uh, I left those slides out, but if you want to go look at the presentation on the company website that these slides are pulled from, or this slide is pulled from, you can see that they are a very diversified um, on both geography as well as customer uh, base IT company, which I think gives it some uh, good uh, staying power uh, in the industry uh, because as Mark noted earlier, uh, talking about eGov, um, certainly um, that industry, this IT services, the outsourcing uh, and so forth have been under uh, significant pressure. Next slide. This is where I decided to get a little fun. Uh, I just, um, I picked eGov the end of February, which is the first green arrow down and then the end of March. You can see that, and then the uh, gold line at the bottom, that's the uh, uh, VTI ETF, the Wilshire 5000 uh, proxy that we, we can use to track relative return. You see that the first month, it was a pretty decent relative return uh, of about 4% or so. I picked it again, and you can see today, both the first pick is running uh, a relative return uh, somewhere in the 10 to 12 range and a little less than that for the second one. So the, the, the picks have done very well relative to the market, but notice although the stock is doing well relative to the market, its future forecast is also very good relative to the market, coming real close to a projected relative return or projection to beat the market by about 10 points over the next five years. So next slide. So I said, okay, CTSH, Cognizant in Disguise, question mark. That of course comes from Mark's criticism of me or his poking me a little bit when I first <laughs> did it, saying that that's just CT, that's just Cognizant all over again, just under a, a different uh, I think ticker. it's the Russians. <laughs> there you go, it's, it's the Russians. I think the Russians, uh, by the end of my first presentation, convinced Mark it wasn't. Uh, CTSH, but it was the Russians. Uh, but uh, the second uh, reason that I ask that question on a more serious note is I've owned Cognizant for quite a while and of course have been uh, presenting it uh, here to the roundtable uh, quite a few times over the years. And quite frequently Cognizant has a very good relative return at the same time that it also has good future prospects. And to me, that's kind of a double-double. A Why not? I mean, what's wrong with a company that has good momentum behind it, good past performance as a stock? I'm not talking about just business performance, but then also continues to have good price prospects that it doesn't look overpriced in the future. So I just grabbed a few cognizant slides 
uh, to compare with. This is, I believe, my first Cognizant pick. I didn't get with Mark to get the, the spreadsheet, but based on my presentation, there may be one before this, but this is pretty early in the roundtable history. Uh, you can see that the first pick is just about even with the market, but what's interesting, you can see how Cognizant has been somewhat volatile and relative to the market uh, over the years. Next slide. Here's uh, a, a second or third pick um, that was in 2013. The stock had uh, fallen off quite a bit uh, since the uh, first pick, and you could see that particular buying low there, it has done extremely well on a relative return basis. So that one, you didn't have the double uh, boost there. A Cognizant was actually down, and this was a buying low situation. Next slide. Keep, keep doing that side right there. Uh, Cy, we've lost your audio. Uh oh, hope we didn't lose him completely. Uh, Cy, can you hear me at all? If you can, will you type something in the chat? Okay, Mark, we've lost size audio, so maybe what we need to do is... We'll go ahead to yours. Maybe you can come back and join us, and then... Okay, sounds we'll, good. We'll slide 19, just remember that, so... Okay. Let's go ahead and go ahead with you, and then we'll come back and let him wrap... Uh, Cognizant, or uh, uh, EPAM. EPAM when okay. he gets back. All right, I've chosen to present the Middleby Corporation this evening. Uh, some of you might know a little bit about Middleby. Uh, they have a, a, a definite... Uh, a definition of what people think they do, but uh, as I've been listening to different people talk about Middleby in the last uh, year or so, I've discovered some very interesting growth drivers for this company, and uh, they've gotten me intrigued to the point that I think that this might be a stock that is underappreciated right now. Uh, Mark, first slide, if you would, or next slide. Uh, Middleby is in three different business uh, segments. Uh, they have a lot of presence in commercial food service, and this used to be uh, as much as 85% of the business they did. Uh, you can see that today it represents 55% of their revenues. Uh, they also have developed a food processing presence, and that presence has stayed relatively consistent uh, at about the 15% you see there. But the place that there's been a lot of growth in this company has been in premium residential. And today that represents 30% of Middleby's uh, uh, revenues, 30% of, of what they bring in in the form of earnings per share. Uh, I mean, in the form of revenues comes from premium residential products. Next slide, Mark. You'll see that by segment, uh, the uh, residential is a, about 30%, uh, and it brings in right now only about 20% of the earnings. You'll see that they're still making more money uh, uh, percentage-wise uh, from their commercial food service products than they do from their residential products. But I'm going to make the case that that might be changing. You'll notice that food processing is about 15% of revenue and about 15% of earnings. If they can continue to keep that blue section pretty big, but widen that green section so that the residential earnings match the residential sales, uh, I think you have a company that's, that's going to be on quite a tear in the next three or four years. Uh, next slide, Mark. Uh, you might not recognize very many of these brands uh, because these are brands that commercial sources use to stock their kitchens, to equip their kitchens. And uh, uh, Middle B is first in pizza chains. In fact, you can read that list as well as I can. First in fast casual, first in Pan-Asian, first in regular casual dining. Uh, so that you can see that Middle B's products uh, are 
uh, equipping the kitchens of, of huge numbers uh, of uh, commercial uh, kitchens, commercial food preparation uh, situations throughout the world. And again, I don't recognize a lot of these names. I happen to have a son that's a chef, however, and he assures me that he knows a lot of these names just by, by recognition. So next slide, Mark. Uh, here's the uh, brands that some of you that, that run a high-class personal kitchen might recognize. Uh, you might recognize Viking for their high-class stoves. Uh, but the one brand that I don't think any of us would recognize unless we happen to have come to this country via Europe is the brand AGA. AGA is the largest uh, provider of uh, refrigerators and stoves to uh, Great Britain and to most of Europe. And AGA is a recent acquisition that was made by Middleby. And you can see in that little pie chart that I've split out down near the bottom that while Viking used to be the lion's share of the business that they did in residential, uh, today it is AGA with more than half of the revenues coming from this recent acquisition uh, and this international brand. AGA is beginning to make a small foray into the North American market, but it is the largest brand bar none uh, in the European markets. Uh, they also have been moving into other markets that I think I'll show you on a slide coming up. Click again if you would, Mark. Yeah, there we are. Uh, there's been a lot of change in where Middleby sells its products. And they're making huge inroads, especially into Brazil and into the United Kingdom, Kingdom and Australia. Uh, they also have major initiatives in India, the Middle East, and China. Uh, and so they're expanding what used to be a, a fairly North American directed company, and they're growing by leaps and bounds internationally. They more than doubled their international business last year, and they're on track to double that business again this year. Uh, they've also moved from a kind of a fractured way of selling their products to national accounts teams, which have greatly streamlined the way they make sales throughout the world. Uh, they've established this residential platform. That's a $3 billion market. And the establishment of the platform came through acquisition. The first major acquisition was Viking. Well, that was four or five years ago. And this AGA acquisition was just within the last year. Uh, they are acquisitive, but they are growing growing organically by about 7%, and then you add some major acquisitions on top of that, you come up with a company that's, that's really doing a lot of really decent growth, and they're not venturing into things that they don't understand. And that always concerns me when a company makes lots of acquisitions, especially when they move into things they might not understand. I'm a little bit worried about Amazon moving into groceries, for example. I think groceries might be a little bit more complicated than selling electronic parts over the internet. Uh, we'll have to just wait and see in the next four or five years. But uh, I don't know. I still think there's a lot of people that like to pick out their own meat, their own bananas, and everything else. Uh, maybe that'll be proved wrong with the newer generations coming up. Uh, they've uh, uh, Middleby's also entered in commercial beverage category. That's a three billion dollar business. Uh, they're making dispensing machines, which are being added to their traditional commercial customers. And then they have continued expansion in commercial food service and in food processing. Again, a lot of acquisition, but all of it fairly focused on what they do best. They are entering into the bakery category. So they're now uh, providing uh, specialized equipment for 
different uh, places to do baking as well as to do the kinds of food service that they might have done uh, in the past. Uh, my son at one point worked for Bob Evans restaurants. I don't know if you've been in a Bob Evans recently, but in the last two or three or four years, Bob Evans has begun to, to feature baked goods and they had to get some new equipment to do that baking, and all of their new equipment came branded by uh, one of Middleby's brands. So next slide, if you would, Mark. Uh, here's the lines, and, and they're pretty decent, up straight and parallel. Uh, this is Morningstar data because I'm using the Better Investing tool. Uh, I would urge you to take a look at the 2015 earnings numbers because they're adjusted. Those are gap numbers uh, that you're looking at in this graph, but uh, the company also put out adjusted numbers, and that 2015 earnings number when it's adjusted is right on trend with the 2014 and 2016 number. So if you're really interested in this company, do take a look at it. You can see the growth rates are, are pretty hefty uh, for this company, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, looking at a company growing at better than 15%. Uh, that 15% has always been kind of a benchmark that if a company can it can move between 12 and 15%, it's doing extremely well. And this one seems to be growing even faster than that. Next slide, Mark. Uh, I pulled the analyst consensus numbers from the uh, SSG Plus tool, and the analyst consensus according to the Morningstar number is about 16% earnings growth going forward. I also pulled the annual rates box from the value line report, and the value line number is about 13% going forward. I'm looking at uh, management numbers that are certainly uh, uh, pretty decent. Uh, I like the trend in the margins. Uh, that's a pretty good return on equity number. It's not clean, but it is based on debt that I think is is uh, entirely defensible, especially when you consider the amount of acquisition the company's making. Uh, we, we like to talk about 30, 33% as the, uh, the rule of thumb, highest value for debt. So this company making a lot of acquisition in a very low interest environment with 37% debt doesn't particularly uh, bother me at all. Next slide, if you would. Uh, I'm looking at the average PE over the last five years, somewhere down around 24. Uh, I look at the graphs, and, and uh, the last five years, since they've begun a serious move into residential, uh, the PEs have uh, moved up from their traditional values of around 19, 20, 21. They've moved up to PEs of 21 to 25 or even 26. So this 24, uh, I think, is uh, is maybe a little bit on the high side, but it's certainly a good number to use as a possible signature going forward. Click again, if you would. And here's the eagle. Uh, you know, I agree pretty much with Mark's Eagle, except when we get down to the PE forecast. Uh, this PE forecast is going back to the way the PE was about uh, 5 to 10 years ago. And 20, I think, was a really good uh, number at that point. But in the last five years, the, and again, it's, it's since the company has moved into this residential uh, section, this uh, selling of things to high-end personal kitchens. Uh, I'm going to suggest, and if you click once more, Mark, you'll see my numbers. I'm going to suggest that 22 might be a more reasonable PE going forward. And when I use 22, I get a par value of about 13%. I'm very happy with the other numbers that are on this eagle, with the other uh, analyst consensus numbers that are being pulled. Uh, and I'm very happy with that number of about 13%. The company does not pay any dividend. It does make a fair amount of acquisition. And there's a boatload of material on the company website if Middleby really intrigues you. I'm going to add one position for Middleby uh, to the roundtable portfolio. Well, thanks, Ken. We'll definitely add Middleby. And again, just to reinforce a, a, a rather simplistic uh 
situation where we're using Middleby with a return forecast of 13 to replace companies like Whole Foods at 1%. That's making the portfolio better. All right, Sai, I believe, has, has rejoined us. Do you want, Sai, are you in a position to, to re-engage? Yes, I am, if you can hear me. I can we can hear you, hear you just fine, Sai. All right. We're going back to slide 19 where, you, where we lost you. Go ahead. Uh, right. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I was trying to get to get us to move to, to that slide. And uh, uh, th th this was uh, after, uh, after the uh, slide that Mark said he wanted to hear more of, and that's when I kept saying things and you all apparently didn't hear me. <laughs> um, but here, here is uh, another pick, the end of 2014. And at that point in time, uh, the first pick was about even. Of course, that uh, pick that we just saw was, was ahead at, at the time. And you can see, again, some volatility relative to the market. But uh, again, the um, relative return is about 10, uh, tip between 10 and 15 uh, since December 2014. Again, this is an example of the situation similar to where EPAM is today where you had a solid relative return um, uh, since the pick, but um, a good uh, prospects going forward. And then I think I have one more slide, which is not the pretty picture. There, uh, again, it was a positive relative return uh, since the first pick and most of the other picks, and it's underperformed the market just a little bit since uh, the middle of 2015. Essentially, uh, that was, uh, a historical high that uh, now we're back into the high and the market has done a little bit better. So my question again, CTSH in uh, disguise, is this a stock that has some momentum as well as good positive prospects? Here's uh, the Eagle. It fits well with what Ken was just talking about. Uh, I've adjusted a, a couple of the um, judgments a little bit. You see the three judgments of uh, sales growth. Uh, I've chosen 20, which is roughly the same as manifests uh, default. Net margin of uh, 8.3, which is a little bit of an expansion uh, over the, the current margin. And then PE forecast of 28. And notice that, uh, and this is probably the biggest caution with the company right now, it's pretty pricey on a PE. Uh, standpoint, although again, it, using the simplified in income statement, I think we de-emphasize PE as a metric. It's just a, a uh, I like to think of it as a risk factor more so than a, a buying or selling matrix or, or metric. Um, the high PE does tell me that there certainly is, is a risk of volatility. On the other hand, if I can get uh, five percentage points greater than the market, which is my goal going forward, even allowing for PE contraction from 44 down to 28 because of solid growth in the company, why am I going to throw that money away? Uh, so I just re recognize that there's likely some volatility ahead as that PE um, contracts. Of course, also understand that many companies just go flat for a while. They get a little bit ahead of themselves. They don't actually fall in price. They just stay flat and let the earnings catch up to the PE. Home Depot, if you go back to early history of that company, you'll see that that's exactly what happened to Home Depot. It zoom in PE, then just stay flat for a while and then take off again. But notice that even though the PE is a bit pricey now, it was 39 when the stock was first picked in February, and uh, you have a solid relative return even at the uh, high PE in, in the first pick. So I'm uh, adding another EPAM, and uh, I only caught the tail end of Ken's uh, presentation. It sounded really good, but uh, let's stick with the facts. You've got a good, solid performer here. Um, no. And so please remember that and hey, vote EPAM. The Georgia elections are over a few days ago, Si. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're coming up on 9, 935 in the east, so let's go ahead and I'll jump into my presentation. We'll wrap up here in five minutes or so and go to the audience poll and then the Q&A. 
Well, one of the things we like to do at Manifest Investing is do this thing we call the long and the short, uh, where we take a look at uh, a spectrum or a panorama of opinions. Of course, we think the most important thing to, to look at is the long-term perspective. On the left-hand side of this chart, you have a number of perspectives that are long-term perspective, um, ranging from that projected annual return, no different than a consensus-driven stock selection guide for any company. You see the return forecasts ranging from the, the low teens up to the 17 to 18 area from top to bottom on this chart. This chart is sorted by the manifest rank, which is our combination of, it's a recipe that combines both the quality ranking and the return forecast, or the PAR, and weights them both equally. We go in search of companies that have decent return forecasts, likely to be in the buy zone, that also have strong quality ratings, or rankings, and a good long-term outlook. Now, the value line low total return forecast, you've seen that represented on a couple of slides here tonight. That's kind of a second opinion that we double check against and you can see that some of the uh, opinions at value line are slightly different than uh, the consensus. Um, the one in red there, Bank of the Internet, is simply red because there is no, uh, it's, a, it's not a standard edition value line company so there is no value line low total return forecast. So again, that's just another indicator. Now the Morningstar and S&P columns on the right that you see there, that's the price to fair value. And anytime that number is less than 100, um, the company is potentially on sale. So anytime it's less than 100, it, 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 it's pretty good until it gets too good to be true. It can get too low. Sometimes you'll see a number in the 30 or 40 percent range that probably needs another shoe to drop or something. So again, going down that list, there are some companies that are, are worthy of further study because their uh, price to fair values are, are a little bit lower. Now those last three columns, that is the one year target price type expectations. Put a lot less credence in those, but maybe use them as a tiebreaker in a situation where if the, the rhinos, the Wall Street and institutional analysts have pretty decent expectations over the next 52 weeks, you know, maybe that will give you some uh, momentum or positive inertia from uh, the get go. And obviously, if they all, if they hate your stock, then that can be uh, like swimming upstream. Could be helpful for accumulation, but maybe a situation you want to avoid. So just looking down the list, there's a number of companies. Notice that EPAM is number two on the list. Size selection for tonight. CBS was featured last month. Uh, again, I'm just going down the list looking for something that kind of resonates with me and gives a little bit of consensus. And I, I come down to Kroger. And in the heels of the thing we talked about earlier, Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods, companies in this industry and well into the sector have just been crushed. And uh, Kroger is the one we want to look at. It has a decent long-term forecast, very decent operating history, decent management, and decent expectations pretty much across the board. So this, this will be posted to the website and uh, the blog, and you'll be able to take a look at this chart later if you want to dig into some of those others. Here's what Kroger looks like. Don't have to go too deep into this. It is up straight and parallel. It is not an exciting growth company. It's a, it's a moderate, mature company in the, the mid-single digits growth range. Uh, call it 5 to 6 percent. It has decent projected net margins for the industry that it's in. Uh, actually pretty razor thin compared to many industries, but not too bad. Compares favorably to companies like Costco and certainly very favorably to other grocers. Um, the P.E. ratios expectations are in that 13 to 15 range. And uh, if you look back to the most recent value line report, which will be updated here in a few weeks, the stock price was in the $30 range back in that time frame. And uh, the return forecast, based on their assumptions, would have been somewhere in that 13% range. Again, the low, which is a good second opinion, to always compare years against uh, in that 9% range. Well, the stock price did drop down to nearly 20. We'll look at that in a second. And that actually puts us back even with more conservative assumptions, lower growth rate, lower PE ratio. You could argue for a little bit more robust PE ratio there. That just drives this number up if you, if you want to play with the sensitivity analysis. The profitability picture for this company is outstanding. I mean, they've been doing a nice job running their business. PEs have kind of bounced around, with, but uh, again, somewhere in that mid-teens, that 15 area, 13 to 15 is certainly a reasonable type uh, consideration for that. 
you can see that the stock price on the announcement of Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods just basically did a cliff dive. That's what you're looking at here on the far right on the on the stock charts uh, image there. Down at the bottom, I've taken out everything but the quality and the return forecast from the Chronicle so that you can see that, interestingly enough, the things that Kroger's been doing just here within the last year have actually ratcheted up the quality versus some of its competitors pretty well. We like to see that. And with this price drop, uh, this will update at the end of June. Kurt locks in the, the, the snapshot of the companies at the month end. So when the end of June comes along, you're going to see uh, all-time high, at least in the last five to six years, for Kroger up in that uh, range somewhere up in this area here. So we we'll, uh, we'll like that a whole lot also. I'm going to go ahead and add Kroger to the portfolio and hope that we have a bit of a special situation here. The other thing that we can talk about a little bit is Amazon and their strategy. They really are attacking Walmart. And they're, they're attacking uh, a Walmart and then on the, the high end with the Whole Foods stuff to get the distribution center. They're really not after, at least not in the first phase of uh, what they're trying to do, these companies in the middle like Kroger. So um, they really are going after Walmart and the companies like Whole Foods. And I do think that the, these companies will be less disturbed. I think that the market overreaction for companies like Kroger has been overdone, probably providing a fairly decent buying opportunity for this company. Mark, we have a hand in the air, so I'm going to unmute Ann Manning. Mm -hmm. Ann, go ahead. You're unmuted. Uh, yeah, my question was a long time ago. Uh, it was about when we were talking about the rule of one. So we can go back to that during discussion if y'all well, want to do that. Let's table up okay. and then we'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and go to the poll, Ken, and we'll press on. All right. Give me just a second here. And our poll is launched. Again, everybody is invited to vote. I still can't look at the poll, huh? Wow. I'd love to get somewhere around 90% voting if we could. We're up over 80. Uh, you just have to use your mouse and click on the company that you think you'd like to add to the portfolio. I'm going to count to 10 in my mind and then close the poll. We're at 88%. Good voter turnout. 90%. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. Oh, pretty hard to argue with Middleby, huh? Hmm. <laughs> it, you know, when I'm picking really good stocks and I add a position, I, I really think it helps the portfolio, but but my uh, my record has not been as good the last eight or ten months yeah. as I would like it to have been. So There's room I for appreciate your confidence, folks. Right. <laughs> I, I think these are three decent uh, picks here tonight. Let's hope that uh, the rule of five doesn't haunt any one of them in particular. <laughs> So I'm going to hide the results, and we're going back to the uh, uh, to the coming attractions right there. Uh, again, I want to talk up the the event in Cleveland. Uh, this will be at uh, up near Mayfield, Ohio, up near the lake, and uh, it'll be at a library up there. You can get directions. This is a Thursday evening. We'll be doing a lot of portfolio management activities. If you're anywhere near northeastern Ohio, uh, come say hi. And then on August 19th, Mark and I will be near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <coughs> we'll be spending an entire day with the central Pennsylvania chapter. And again, if you're anywhere near that area, uh, there is a small fee attached to it. Lunch is also included. Uh, come on and, and join us for an, a very interesting day of, of talking stocks. And, and uh, again, we're going to focus a little bit uh, on portfolio management, and we're going to talk about selling uh, among some of our other topics. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be Mark, working up some other Mark. presentations in a variety of different areas. We just loved it. We learned so much from you guys when we're out spending time face-to-face, -face and it really does it helps considerably. 
The other thing that I just wanted to mention here tonight is we are going to put on more programs on Tuesday nights that are not roundtable nights. Um, we'll do a couple here during the summer, but beginning it with the beginning of the school year with that presentation on September 5th that you see there, we're going to try to make it a regular thing where we'll tackle a subject of interest, whether it's even an individual company or some of the more finer aspects of some of this stuff, and we'll, they're probably all pretty much all going to be scheduled on Tuesday. And we will have video archives up and running of uh, the, the roundtables over the last several sessions. I've been kind of busy here the last couple of weeks, but uh, those will be up and available here very soon. And we'll certainly save those other presentations also if you're unable to um, attend on Tuesdays. And, Mark, and, my, uh, go on, uh, go on, Cy. Yeah, I to say I, I didn't uh, mention it to you all to get get on the slide, but the Atlanta or the uh, Georgia chapter has an education fair on July the 22nd. That's a Saturday, and you can, of course, check their, their website and get details. But uh, I will be, be appearing there and talking about one of my uh, current favorite things. It's a long-time favorite thing, but I haven't actually done formal class in rethinking risk. Um, so we'll be, we, we'll be talking about why volatility isn't risk, but it's opportunity. Uh, so if you're anywhere in the uh, southeast and you want to drive a ways, or certainly the Atlanta area, uh, join us uh, for that. Uh, Doug Gerlach's also appearing and, and uh, several other people. So I'll go ahead and add that to our events uh, listing also, Cy, and make, make people aware of that also. All right. Okay, Mark, we do have a, a pretty uh, nice set of questions here, so if you're ready to move into q and I'll I'll start firing some at you, some of them at you, okay? I'm going to go back to where Ann was just at, but go ahead. Okay, Leo would like to know uh, if you could just really briefly explain the components of quality and how a company like McDonald's might arrive at a 95 quality score. Okay. Let me go ahead and jump out of this and just real quickly go to my favorite website. And since Leo mentioned McDonald's, what you're looking at for a company like McDonald's, for any company, you can go to the company report page and, and see the consensus judgments. Uh, for example, at McDonald's, we're using a growth rate of 3.4%, net margin of 266 and a PE ratio of 16. So that takes a lot of the mystery out of what are they, what are they thinking. But what I want to show here is here are the four components of quality. And uh, the financial strength rating is very close to a A++ rating for uh, McDonald's. The earnings per share stability is the second leg of the stool or pillar. And again, that's a very consistent, fairly straight earnings line. And then what we do is we compare the sales growth rate for the company versus its peers or competitors and the profitability, in this case measuring the net profit margin forecasts for the company versus its peers or competitors. And uh, what, you, what you see here for McDonald's is actually a fairly strong rating. Now that's the raw score. We convert that into a percentile ranking. Percentile ranking is what you see up at the top. And again, that's the number that most people can resonate with. Again, it's in the top five percentile of all companies when you basically take those four elements. Again, financial strength, stability or consistency in the form of a fairly straight earnings line, and then a comparison of uh, the growth and profitability characteristics versus a company's industry. And we Mark, I'm going to add, add a little bit to your answer, if it's okay with you. Uh, Leo's question focused on uh, the fact that McDonald's has uh, some negative equity right now on its balance sheet, and uh, I want to just emphasize that the first two scores in the quality component are coming from other sources. They're not numbers that Mark has made up out of whole cloth. They're, they're nothing more than composite numbers coming from sources like Value Line, Morningstar, S&P, and a couple of other places. So that uh, when you see a really high financial strength score, that just means that the various rating agencies have uh, indicated that McDonald's has a stellar uh, financial rating and uh, that's what that component is coming from. That's what makes it up. So uh, 
you, you can't focus on one thing on the balance sheet and come to the conclusion that the balance sheet isn't of a high quality. Right. Well, uh, the, the, reason McDonald, the reason McDonald's, and, and this is beyond what we need to talk about, but I'll just throw it out and, and everybody can explore it. The reason McDonald's has negative equity is they've bought back a boatload of the stock. And when you buy back your stock at significantly higher prices than it was issued, it does a reverse equity on you. And so basically it's, it's simply a paper accounting transaction. It has absolutely nothing to do with the financial ability of the company, which is why you've got value line and everybody saying A++, yet you've got negative shareholder equity. Oh. It's, all in the, it's all in the treasury stock item. Thanks a lot, Cy. Uh, Mark, Joe would like to know, would like you to go to slide nine. Uh, he wants to know what XX dash WS, et cetera, means on that slide. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and take care of that because some, some people have, have asked about that. What, what we're doing here is basically building this comparison over time since the time the stock was selected on big charts. So let's go ahead and just do a real quick look. And we'll try not to make this run out too long. But on bigcharts.com, I think it's marketwatch.com in the case of eGov, enter the tickle symbol, enter interactive chart, and then you can build a chart. Oh, we're getting ads, huh? I don't want the ad. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay. Um, and under any company, down here, when you click through on the industry, you actually are taken to a, a industry page for the company. And in this case, this will answer the question I left everybody. I can't believe they're doing that with their advertising. I need to turn on some of my filters. But in this case, the industry that's involved is the Internet Online Index. And if you look at this ticker right here, I don't know if I can highlight it or not, this ticker right here is that industry. So you can compare that company, you just, just write down that ticker, WSJ, IX, US, and uh, ISV are the only numbers, letters that are different. You can compare this industry index versus any company. So again, to, to repeat, if you're going into any company, let's look at McDonald's just to make a point. Again, looking at McDonald's, and we'll end up with a different industry. And under the information for McDonald's above the first chart that comes up, you can see this uh, cl click through to the industry. In the case of McDonald's, the in industry is the restaurants index, restaurants. And you can see that these last three letters are, are different. So that would be the industry for McDonald's. So you can build the comparison versus the Wilshire 5000 or the S&P 500, whatever whatever to your heart's content, and then this is how you find that industry comparison that we are showing here for eGov, building this line right here. Does that help? Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Let's go back to Ann. Ann Manning, you're unmuted again. Why don't you ask? Okay, can you hear me? We certainly can. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to go back to the slide. Um, I think it's one before that. Okay. I think I know the answer to my question, but I want to ask it anyway. Where you are having the ones over there by Stryker and Biotechni and NetLease, does that mean it was just uh, bought one time? Yep, Is one that time what you're selection. saying? One time selection. Okay. So that has nothing to do with you're talking about the rule one. No, no. Okay, okay. And also my other question is, so you're doing, your list you did here was whatever was below the my par for the day. Yes. Okay, okay. You're looking, and, you're looking at companies with return forecasts that are lower than the market average. Okay, for my okay. Part. Okay, and one other comment, I just personally want to thank Cy for bringing EPAM because she, he's made me a good bit of money in the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ann. Well, we need to visit Houston and get you to buy us dinner. Okay, sounds like a deal. <laughs> okay. Maybe I can come to Dallas when you come. There you go. We'd love to see you. Okay. Thanks a lot. 
Okay, and we're bringing, uh, let's see, we're going to uh, George. Uh, George doesn't agree with us selling just two parts of the position uh, in um, uh, eGov. He suggests that we should have sold all six pieces, and uh, I think a great case could be made for, for that as well. Uh, I think we're demonstrating two different things, however, and kind of arguing two different arguments if we, if we make that argument as opposed to the argument we made. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm not 100% on board with even selling the two. I mean, really, if you if you look at a stock selection guide, stock study on eGov, it's it's pretty up straight and parallel. I mean, this is a tiny company, but it's well managed. It's kind of a reminds me a little bit of the early days of uh, your Lansing company. Um, the Neogen. name is escaping me. Neogen. Neogen, yeah, and. Uh, Everything that I, I look at over the long term, uh, decent return forecast is probably in the buy zone, and it has a very high quality rating. So uh, I don't know. I mean, this is this is one where we've got, we've got four feet in the bucket where they've been around longer than a year, two feet in the short term bucket. I'm not quite sure what to think yet about doing that. So we'll sell them and see what the heck happens. Yeah, uh, I'm just uh, telling. Uh, uh, who is it? It's George. Uh, George, the we're, we're testing some ideas right now, and uh, the ideas are to to try to limit uh, capital loss in the first year. Uh, our goal eventually is to also set some triggers to to kind of limit the loss of capital gains going forward. Uh, but we haven't got to a place yet where we've decided what those triggers should be. So we're kind of in the middle of the argument at the present time. And I see exactly what you're saying. I understand exactly what you're saying. And uh, I think you can probably argue all around this from three or four different directions. Uh, the point that George makes is that uh, the market does not care at what price the positions were purchased. Oh, I, and I fully agree with that. I fully agree. But at the same point, I mean, you go back to my example of Iconics brands where we lost 80% and then we lost another 80%, uh, it, it, it can really cut pretty deep. One of the things that I did want to show the audience, if, especially if you're Manifest subscribers, if you're not and you want this, this article, send, it, send me a note. Um, the current cover story try, attempts to summarize some of the conversation Ken and I had with the Cincinnati Convention audience. And... Uh, You'll see as we go through it, we talk about the rule of five. We talk about how often we're seeing that we're sharing our findings, um, just kind of describing the process of what we think might happen. So you can actually go to that at the Manifest Investing website, and I'll probably post this on the blog if somebody asks me to. No, the blog is expectingalpha.com. So if you want a little bit more depth on the stuff, and then there's also an article going back a year ago when we first started talking about this stuff, you notice our sell button there where we went through and this is this is the point we were just making about maybe maybe selling those two positions this gets a little bit grainy here but this was that iconics brand stop limit at 20 percent and then we watched that thing fall all the way down here we we think that avoiding that type of situation can make a substantial difference in the portfolio over the long term uh, we have a comment. The only thing I'm is, going, sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, and and I I understand the theoretical uh, side, and I don't even uh, you know since it's something that that we're playing with, I don't even think that it's necessarily bad to to talk out of both sides of our mouths and hold some and not hold some because it it can even give you some some easy comparisons. The thing is, though, uh, I will side with the George in that, again, what matters is our relative return going forward. And the relative return going forward from today is the same for all six positions. I abs and the I trigger, absolutely agree trigger, with you. Yeah. The trigger may be only two positions, but, you know, as of today, that, you know, we're going to, like Mark said, either losing, it may be, especially if the 
the early positions have done extremely well. It may be a loss of accumulated capital gain, you know, unrealized right, gain, gain. Yeah. as opposed to a loss of principal. But the reality is the impact on your real life portfolio is identical by all six positions. If it's going to crater like Iconics, those four positions we're holding are going to crater. It's just they're going to crater from a different position. Right. right. And if it's going to crater, maybe that teaches us a lesson about what we're trying to do as well then, right, Cy? Absolutely. Maybe, yeah, that, and, and if you get course, rid of if you get rid of one out of six, you get rid of the other five as well. Then, yeah, that's that's right. And and of course, and I as I've thrown out in this discussion, and again, I realize this is being being discussed. I'm not. I, I understand some of the theory behind it, and I think it's intriguing to look at. I'm not. Uh, and we, we've just got to see what happens. Uh, but as I also mentioned, and, and I forgot your articulation of it last month, uh, Ken, but uh, if this does show some promise, we can uh, eventually, when you've got any position you're considering buying, is essentially jump back 12 months or whatever the right period is and test a, a potential buy against the last 12 months yeah, and absolutely. see it, is this potential buy, has it already encountered that situation, you know, if we had bought it in previous months, if this ends up being a valid, a valid test. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, I think it is important to, to, to uh, concur with you or, or, or understand what George is saying. And I think it's, it's vital. But on the other hand, as y'all are stressed, I mean, even Mark's kind of saying if he wasn't, going by the numbers and testing this theory, he really doesn't want to sell e and, yeah. <laughs> and and that and, and that's a perfectly legitimate position, which is why also I don't think it's inconsistent to hold for and sell too, although once we really believe, start believing there's some credence behind this, you should be selling all six. Absolutely. One yeah. thing I would like to actually add to the conversation is we are getting some criticism where people will take a look at one position and say, look, it went up 10% since you did that last month. That has no bearing. I don't want to be cruel, but uh, you really have to look at what happens with the entire portfolio over the long term. And um, you, you can cherry pick individual decisions all you want. <laughs> We're going we're yeah. to, you know, there are going to obviously be times when it didn't turn out to be such a good idea. That's investing. But as this summary says right here, we have gone back and looked at uh, several years for a number of different portfolios. And the one that we're looking at in this case, the, the rate of return was improved from 11.1 .1 to 13.3 by implementing this type of methodology. That 2.2%, as Cy started the evening talking about, the per, when we're talking about performance, that is huge over the yeah. long term. And that's what this chart shows you to, on the left. So as, as we test this thing out, yeah, there are going to be times when we sell something like an eGov and it goes up 30% next month. <laughs> you know, that, that's just going to happen. But when you look at applying the discipline and, you know, measuring how the discipline performs over time, if we get anything like those numbers that you see on this page, that that's a game changer, guys, and that's why we're doing this. Oh, yeah. and, and it's no different than back in some high-flying days uh, when uh, people I know sold stocks that doubled in the last month and the stock promptly doubled the next month. Uh, that's investing. That's on the upside, but same thing happens. So. Yep. Uh, Let's see, Mark, we have a comment from Jane. Uh, Jane uh, is originally from the UK. Uh, she says that uh, AGA, or AGA, uh, as my wife has told me in, during this presentation, is the way you pronounce that range, uh, is well respected in the UK. Uh, Natalie is sitting here listening to my presentation, and she went on uh, YouTube and found a, a Martha Stewart thing uh, extolling this AGA uh, range. So if you're really interested in Middle B and this AGA commercial range, uh, Martha is talking great things about it on YouTube, well, okay? If you're channeling Martha Stewart, we got to say good night. Yeah. <laughs> AGA. AGA, Natalie says. AGA. AGA. Uh, all right. 
Uh, Kay wants to know uh, about the recordings. Kay, we know that the recordings are late. They are going to be put up on YouTube. But uh, Mark has had a very interesting last couple of months, and he's just a little bit behind right now. Would you kind of be patient? And we, we hope that within the next couple of weeks, uh, we will have April, May, and June up on the YouTube channel for you to listen to. Uh, John, uh, well, we're getting comments about specific stocks, and I'm going to skip over those uh, for a moment. Uh, Hugo, uh, Hugo, your hand's in the air, so I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead uh, and speak to us, Hugo. Uh, Hugo, I think you're muted on your end. Can you all hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. Oh, great. Uh, I sent in my question on the little box here for the go-to webinar. Uh, was, the question is, uh, Amazon paid about 800 per square foot for retail space. Uh, it doesn't include warehouses, uh, and maybe they have other plans and uh, possibly enhanced distribution of perishables, and just kind of wondering uh, about any thoughts you have around that. Well, I guess I can field that a little bit since I'm the one who presented Kroger. Um, you know, even in reinforcement of my, my remarks about some of what they're doing, the whole food stuff is all about distribution. They are also um, identifying logistic, the best logistics companies in the country to, um, to go after. In fact, I have a colleague who works for uh, one of the leading logistic companies in this area, and rather than wait for Amazon, they went to them. Uh, so they are definitely very focused on the the distribution uh, challenge obviously Walmart has quite a leg up on them to begin with um, so it'll be interesting to see how they handle that challenge but I think they're going about it the right way when they go out and really uh, attempt to secure some of the industry leaders if you go to uh, Seeking Alpha and there's, there's a lot of noise on Seeking Alpha but if you do a quick search on either Kroger or Amazon there's a number of articles that you can engage in that, that describe what the the question that are responsive to the question that you're asking, and uh, I would encourage you to do that. The other thing that you can do, if you want to dig, every week we put out a a month a week, weekly update. That's a Susan Michellic T-shirt, by the way. We'll talk more about that. But one of the things we include is stuff that we think is uh, relevant to what's going on. This is a fairly decent article about why Amazon is eating the world. So you just click through to onto those, and you can see some of the topics that uh, this this article is definitely responsive to what you're talking about, Hugo. And there's Mr. Bezos right there. Uh, Don uh, has wanted wants to know, Mark, can you go to slide 12 on the presentation? Did Mark, we, did we lose you? No, we didn't lose you. Just working. Okay. <laughs> and Cy, Don wants to know, uh, uh, do you have any uh, comment on the stock SIMO that's on slide 12? I will, I will say first, I know nothing about the company, though I'll make a couple observations from this slide if you or Mark don't have any comments to make if you're familiar. I'm not familiar with the company. I don't. Mark, this must have been one of your choices. I don't even recognize this particular company. No, this is a screen. No, this is a screen. Oh, this, this is, is a, a screen. screen. Okay, screen. this is a screen. I, I'm not familiar with this company at all. No. This, this is one of those companies that probably qualifies for that Internet of Things conversation that we were having in the pre-session. And, uh, you might dig in and study the company. It actually came to us via the, the, the best small companies effort that we do every year in the autumn when the leaves begin to fall and Halloween is right around the corner. This is on that best small companies list for this year. I do think that some of the projections have been kind of frothy. And it might be a little bit steep, but it's a company worthy of study to see if they may have uh, some good mouse traps that uh, they're trying to bring to a a specialized market that has again that has to do with internet of thing and things and that sort of stuff yeah uh, just on this slide and this will this will uh, clue in uh, a few of y'all on how I use screening 
uh, and so forth. Uh, I see both very strong pauses and and some some less positive things just on here. And but I would encourage people to look at it. the The biggest negative I see right now is the financial strength of just sixty. I think with the market where it is, I tend to, to like 80s and 90s right now. But again, in a that's not necessarily for your whole portfolio. If you've got a strong portfolio that's in the 80 to 90 average, you can get a little uh, uh, a little frothy uh, or 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 looser with some. So so that's not a deal breaker. But that jumps out on the negative. Mark was starting to point out the earnings stability, although again, on a high growth company, that earnings stability uh, can can be both positive and negative. If you have something that's growing out of growing out of trend, you're going to get a low earnings stability. So that in and of itself isn't necessarily bad, but uh, but you would have to look at it. The things though that jump out at me that make this company potentially intriguing is you've got a yield of two percent uh that's a, a bit above market for a small company that's uh that's interesting notice also the projected pe is only 11. um that's pretty low again for this market and for a tech company uh, especially given the growth rate of 13.7 and then of course you've got a very nice 94 overall quality so um the yellow tends to indicate like mark said there may be some frothy projections uh, but that low PE and that yield, um, you may be able to notch down the projection, ratchet the projections down a little bit and still come up with a very attractive company. So, I, you know, I'm looking solely at numbers, knowing nothing about the company itself. But uh, now that it's popped up on the screen and uh, Don brought it to my attention, I think it's something worthy of looking closer at. Uh, I'm going to unmute Len. Len, go. Hi there. Hi there. We can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead with your comment okay. or your question. SIMO is a Taiwanese company that makes controllers for SSDs. One of their major customers is Intel. Okay. And it was discussed in the forum oh, about five or six months ago. And Ted Brooks did, uh, as I remember, a pretty deep dive on it. Thanks, Len. Thank you so much. Much appreciated, Len. Yeah. One of the hi, I wanted, by the way. Hey, hi to Judy. Okay. Yep. Yeah. One of the things that we might point out is for any company, if you go into the company, in this case, Semo, at the manifest site, you can actually dig into what Len was just describing. If you use this little hourglass up by the company name, you can look at industry news down here, but manifest investing specific stuff, kind of like our own little Seeking Alpha. Um, articles that have included stuff about SEMO are right here, along with discussions. And here's the here's what Len is talking about right here. And here's a post by Len right here. So you can actually get to any company and, and look at... Uh, discussions and some of the stuff that's posted there is outstanding Matt Spielman's work is awesome yeah I'm going to try to avoid just picking stocks at random and talking about them here so uh, we have some people asking about Buffalo Wild Wings CHR Robinson synchronous technology uh, but uh, we we don't we're not prepared to react to individual stocks in a session like this so uh, if you really would like us to discuss a particular stock, if you would drop me or Mark or Cy an email uh, five or six days before the next roundtable, we'll try to include a discussion about that particular stock. And again, we can't do that more than once or twice a roundtable, uh, but at least we can answer some of the questions from those of you that are persistent. Yeah, and some, uh, of, Ken, some of those Tuesday night sessions that we'll be doing, we'll, we'll have an open floor for that sort of thing. We've done that fairly often at some of the open house, open open microphone, open table session. Okay, so Mark, if you could just go back to that coming event slide one last time. Okay. And uh, uh, what Mark's talking about is a session that we're going to do the day after Labor Day. Uh, we will be reminding folks uh, about it through our regular reminder list. 
and my wife has asked me to remind the audience that uh, this list that we're using for folks outside of mid-Michigan is our own uh, email list. It's not the list that belongs to Better Investing. So if you change the email address at Better Investing, you're not necessarily changing the email address on our list. So uh, we just want you to be aware that one change isn't enough. If you do change your email address, drop us a line also, and we'll change it in our database uh, as well. So with that, Mark, I think we've cleared up all the questions. We've cleared up all the hands raised. And again, just a big thanks to you and to Cy for sticking this out for seven years. I don't think that any one of us thought it would last for seven years <laughs> no when we started this thing. Yeah. No costumes. Um, we'll, no costumes. That's great. So we'll see you all uh, next month uh, for the uh, July edition of the Mid-Michigan Roundtable. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night.